Barbara Jean, you seem to wear a lot of hats in life. My introduction or barely touched on your many skills and attributes. I can well understand why you needed a stage name to encapsulate what you do and who you are. How did you decide upon the Cosmic Oracle? Oh, that's a good question, Sharon Ann. I was in meditation and this was after my near death experience. And I, and I afterwards, one of the ways I healed myself was through meditation. And while I was sitting in meditation, it just came to me. It says, you are the cosmic oracle. Oh, wow. and, I, and I'm thinking, I look around and, and I, I didn't hear the words, but I sensed it, the cosmic oracle. What's the cosmic oracle? So my feeling behind it was that when I went on my um, near-death experience, I was taken, one of the places where they took me was to a temple, a Greek temple floating in space. Mm. And, and, and later, much, much later, I went to Greece and to uh, the temple of Athena and to the Rock of Sybil and uh, all the beautiful temples there. And, and it was after I had visited that that that's when the cosmic oracle came. And I think it's because I really felt like I might have had a past life mm -hmm. uh, as an oracle because it felt so, um, I could feel it. I just could sense it and know it. There was a part of me that resonated with it to every part of my resonance of me, right? And so yeah. mm -hmm. um, it just, when, it, when that came through, it just clicked. And so I feel like I'm, um, uh, when people come to me and my healing work that I do with people, I do a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. When they come, it's like I can tap into something that's greater than me. It's like and the that's, Right. And it's like the oracle, like the oracle would. Now, in the old days, the priest would then interpret what the oracle said. But I'm a women's, not a women's liver, but a women's, uh, a, a real 20th century woman here. And, and mm -hmm. I don't feel like I need anyone to interpret it. And so mm -hmm. that's the difference. And so I, I feel like the cosmic oracle is taking a, a bit of the web of all that is and bringing it in and then uh, bringing it down into my crown and sixth chakra and, and then sending that message out as a clear of a vessel as I can be and neutral as a messenger to the person who receives it. So uh, I don't do, someone said, well, Barbara, do you do, um, do you uh, do future readings? Is that what being a cosmic oracle is, is doing the future? And, and I could see where they would understand that. I don't do a lot of future though. I'm really careful of how I do that. Because um, I, my job as an oracle, as a psychic, as a spiritual healer and teacher is to show the doorways and uh, put some light into darkness that can give the person receiving the reading some choices that maybe they might not have thought about. And yeah. so for me, that's more of an oracle that yeah. I uh, work with the person spirit to spirit. And that's this lifetime, many past lifetimes, this body or not this body, it's interdimensional, it's it's uh, all, all of the above, and that's the cosmic part. So mm. uh, that's kind of my definition of it, just I hope that makes yes, sense so. in some way. When you, when you were talking before, I was getting this um, Atlantean feel too. So yes, yes, it's exactly. got any connection, because you mentioned the Greek, and I was thinking, oh, I'm picking up more of an Atlantean, like a water bearer, kind of yes. that type of oracle person. Yes, That's yes. how I kind of, kind of had you pigeonholed, I suppose. Yeah. Well, mm. well, and I ended up spending some time in Santorini, and oh. uh, and on that island there, and they say that's where, you know, there is a theory on the History Channel, or I'm not sure which channel, that mm. actually that is where Atlantis sunk. And oh, so really? there okay. is that part so you're right on target with that as well oh, there it, you go yeah it, and it feels right you know sometimes it can be really simple and it just feels right so so it and also it stuck <laughs> the <Yeah>. name stuck. <laughs> <laughs> they go aren't you the cosmic oracle i go oh yeah i am that's right you know so um, oh, i think that's a great name and i, I agree with you um 
you know, the whole crown chakra and, and getting the information and that connection to the Akashic, I, I felt that uh, when I was, I've, I've written a series of books, sci-fi novels back in two, between 2008 and 2011, I wrote three books and um, got them published in 2012, fortunately. And uh, during that time, I would go to the library and I'd, I'd drop my kids at school and then I'd go to our local library and I'd sit down and this is this would be about 10 a.m. in the morning and then suddenly I'd wake up and it was my alarm was going off and it was 2 p.m. and I did that for, for roughly a three year block of time and the librarians used to call me spooky because they, <laughs> they say I'd go off to this what, what I think I was doing was I was connecting to this right. Akashic record because right. it was it was funny I'd write in that that vein probably every other day I would do this zoning I call it zoning in and then the next day I would edit what I had zoned based or channeled mm -hmm. and when I when I started editing I would do like research checking obviously to see and I would find a lot of the stuff that I had channeled was real which is, you know, and that's kind of when you kind of wake up and you go, okay, okay, th there is something, to, you know, this Akashic, you know, and that's so what you were saying before going through your crown chakra and that made complete sense to me. I've actually had that experience myself. I can't seem to do it anymore. It seems to have just been in that that time, those those three years. So I don't know what was so different. Um, I've never been a meditator, though. I, I, I'm one of these people that... I have to keep doing things or I can't just sit <laughs> still and there must be something for people like me. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Well, we each have to find what that is, right? That could be gardening. That could be walking. It could be going to the ocean. It could be knitting. I have a friend who knits. All right. <laughs> I, I do puzzles. I do love well, puzzles. puzzles. Then that could be it. That's your time. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. where you're in between, or I think most artists uh, and creators get in like the zone that you're talking about, where they're the closest with spirit, where you're, yeah. they're united, and and that's where there's no time, you know. Yes, you, you, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's exactly in this beautiful space. Uh, so it's a relationship that you build. Yes, and, it, and work it. It kind of scared me though when I, a lot of the research I was doing I was finding I was channeling really obscure detail and I mm. was then then a few months later I remember I was talking I'd be talking to people and they'd say oh that's so and so and I'd then go and do the research on that person and it was what I had channeled and it was <sighs> bizarre. I know like scary yeah. stuff spooky yeah. <laughs> no I have something similar in a different way when I was able to go to Greece much later after the NDE and we were at the Rock of Sybil all the different places we went we would I went with 35 other psychics and so we would get there and amongst us we would go into meditation and you would go back in time and you would get a lot of information i don't have those recordings but you would see it so clear you would see the people with their baskets and you would see them coming and the bustle of the of the town square and like you were just right back there so in all the information like you were saying the little details would come that a person when you open your eyes and are back into current time space uh, you wouldn't have that information at all. No, I know. It's just amazing, huh? <laughs> but Matt, it, <clears throat> I suppose it's part of the journey to realise that there's something more than just what we are and, you know, there's, and that time is uh, doesn't really exist. Exactly, exactly. So now in 1989, you had a very public, and I say public, <laughs> near-death experience. Um, what brought on the NDE and oh. would you share your experience during the NDE itself, the actual what, what, where you went? Because it would have been a, quite a long one if it was two to three days, wasn't it? Yeah, it was two. I was in two and a half days, almost three days. Uh, what happened was, and uh, I'll give you maybe the shorter version. <laughs> yes. uh, okay. um, I went into the building. It was a kind of a strange day. I went into the building with a friend and sat down at a women's healing event. Mm -hmm. And I was there because I had trouble breathing. And when I 
sat down, there were like a thousand knives into my chest oh. and I couldn't breathe and I was gasping for air and, uh, but I couldn't really say anything. And what happened was, is that I passed out. And when they took me and sat me up in a chair, I full body channeled of a being from Egypt. Oh, and right. I had no idea that I had the ability to channel. I went there to meet my friends and her mother for the first time. <laughs> and she said, later, goodies, right? <laughs> <laughs> and she said later, you know, mom, she's not normally like that. So don't, you know, okay. And I did meet her later. And, and, and what had happened to me when I sat back up, um, I looked very ancient. I looked kind of a green veneer color to my skin, even is what they told me about 35 of the women. I talked to them afterwards because I, checked out the pain was too excruciating so I checked out so there was a fight for for my soul there because the being that came into my body then shouted to the women or very loudly that he was here to kill Barbara Jean because she had information that couldn't be given at this time and then he collapsed both my lungs and so when he did that, I shot totally out of the body, and then they took care of my body. It's in an ICU unit. I made it. I flatlined. They did the defibrillator so many times that it just really fried me on the inside. I have some some things from that afterwards. But as I'm fighting for my life, they did give me my the last rites, said that when I come back that I probably wouldn't be like the Barbara Jean that they knew before. And so it was really at death's bed. They didn't think I would make it through the night at all. So I have this all going on in the hospital at that. They moved me from the women's retreat to the ICU unit. And um, we have the whole school, about 800 people, maybe half of them or so, uh, uh, praying for me, too, and seeing what's going on. At the school, what the psychic said in a row, you have a row of psychics that are reading the energy. They said that they saw this being as the ancient Egyptian being was a very uh, strong being and he was there to kill me. But it didn't happen because another being came in and and fought him for my life. And that being's name was Thor. And that's... Uh, oh. <laughs> and I had no idea, you know, this is back in December of 1989. So none of these Marvel stories were out. None of that was out at that time. But that's what came in. And uh, later I developed a relationship with Thor, but that's a whole nother story. But at the time, he fought and, and uh, protected me from evil. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as that was happening with my, they were doing with my soul, my body was being watched. I checked out. I wasn't aware of the fight. I wasn't aware of my body at all. And I had absolutely no pain, not one sense of pain. And where I went was this beautiful, dark, undulating water, warm water. And I'm floating in this warm water with no ending, no beginning, as far as I can see, of this love water. It's all this love I'm the love, it's me, I'm it, it's intelligent, it's creative, it's moving, it's, it's, and I'm just blown away with how much love that I'm a part of. And I just have a total melt into this holy of holy of love, cosmic love, love that's with unconditional love that is beyond anything that I had ever experienced. And I'm a very loving, giving person naturally, and I have three children that I adored. And but this was beyond anything I had ever imagined uh, to be in this much love. And I'm in this love, and I'm floating there, and I'm becoming one with it, and then one with everything. And I totally let go, and let go, and let go. And I'm in this blissed out, loving, expanded consciousness space beyond, beyond. And then in just a split second, I look down and I notice I don't have a body. And I kind of, and I go, what? I don't have a body. <laughs> how can, how can that be? How can I exist without a body? How, how is that possible? Because I, I was a single mom with three kids. I wasn't, I didn't know anything about anything about any of this. Okay. So I, 
I was blown away, absolutely, totally blown away that, and I was trying to rock it in my reality, in my perception. So really, I was kicked out of my matrix of who I thought it was at that time. And in that moment of trying to figure out in a way of how this is starting to work, I go in a second and I'm up on a spaceship. And that's the first time I'd ever been on a spaceship that I knew of. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I get on the spaceship, it's a circular room. It has no uh, very soft and white and no seams. It's very uh, smooth and slick, but uh, sweet smelling. And I'm sitting in what I called at the time a dentist like chair where I have my feet up in um, little place, place. Like Stirrups, yes, in stirrups, thank you, in stirrups, and my hands are on each side in these cushions, and I have a, a cushion for the back of my head, and I'm just kind of hanging there, and it's just really comfortable, and I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm a 37-year-old woman, I'm from Earth, but this doesn't feel like Earth to me, you know, so, but I didn't freak out at all, I'm, I'm just thinking, wow, this is interesting, and in that moment, a um, a tall, the tallest being I had ever seen, probably about eight foot tall, maybe taller, comes floating towards me. I couldn't see his feet, but he was very beautifully, gracefully comes towards me. And he has a big white hood on and he has big, huge white shoulders, long white robes, long flowing robe down, beautiful Leonardo da Vinci hands, gorgeous. And he, I look into his big white hood and he's faceless. It's dark, it's black, but I don't freak out. And he says to me, because I'm, you may call me the guardian and I'm here to interpret uh, between you and some beings that you're going to meet. And so I said, okay. And then he just takes his hand and moves it out. And then a light appears. Uh, to my right and it's a large glass wall and behind the glass wall are about 10 beings I don't know I didn't count them I wished I would have but I didn't and there's like taller ones there's fat ones there's skinny ones they all have their personalities and they're all telepathing amongst themselves they have the same white robes on I can't see their faces and I was a designer at the time I'm thinking did they got get them on sale or something you know because <laughs> I just kept thinking, you know, you think they would have some some kind of difference, but they didn't. And so then they would talk amongst themselves, telepath, get excited. They would tell that information to the one person or the being, and then the being would tell my guardian, and the guardian would tell me. And that's how we went back and forth. I, I don't remember exactly what was said, but what they decided was that they would show me I think they had already planned it experientially, and that's how they taught me. So in that next moment, I, uh, a round circular window comes toward Become one with the Mother Earth. She comes right into me, and I become one with her, and we resonate at the same, the same heartbeat, that her heartbeat is my heartbeat. And I didn't know how beautiful our planet was. I didn't know how alive she was. And I cried like a baby. I just cried because I just felt like I, there was, she was there and I just, I was an idiot. Like, you know, I didn't know that she was alive and she was beautiful and that we needed to protect her and take care of her, that she's a jewel in our galactic system. And, um, we, we have to take care of her. We must take care of her. We're guardians of her. And um, and then my heart and her heart became one like a drum, a native uh, a star nation's drum of just a beautiful heartbeat and a resonance with her. And um, I don't know how long I was there, but I, I, uh, her and I became like this. We became like besties, okay? And so, um, I'll talk later maybe about what happened in my life because of this experience. So from that experience in just in a minute, just in a, like a snap of a finger, after I got what I needed to get there from that teaching, then I, my guardian and I flew out of the spaceship and were um, flying over 
hills, these huge hills and valleys of trees, just mm -hmm. forest and millions of miles of forest, not millions, but miles and miles of forest. It just, for as far as my eye could see, it was forest. There were no human buildings, no uh, any attachments. It was just forest. Since then, the closest I'd gotten after the experience was England, um, England, you know, the England forest in Scotland, Ireland, and that. And the green was just beautiful. It was the most expansive green tech the color green I had ever experienced in my whole life. So, so many varieties of green and my heart burst open with love. Just, I had been going through a divorce. And so I feel like it just healed my heart. It healed every aspect of me with the color of green. And um, so I'm with that. And then in a heartbeat, the next step, then I'm going um, down on a, uh, steps and I go to go up these steps are like alabaster steps they're lit from above I'm I'm barefoot but I look down I still don't have a body but I go up the stairs and there's a platform and to the right is this, these beautiful circular columns Greek columns with a round uh, rotunda but it's open and it's floating in stars so we're floating in the middle of the galaxy around these stars and I walk uh, across the grass. I could feel the grass on my feet, but I don't have a body. Mm -hmm. And there's that group of beings, the same robes. I don't know what's up with that. But <laughs> I really, <laughs> you know, it's on sale. Must be in a New Year sale, <laughs> a Boxing Day sale. <laughs> and maybe it was for my comfort. That was something that I yeah. could be okay with, right? And so they're uh, in a big circle, and they open the circle, and they let me in, and they take both my hands and and the moment I take their hands, it's like electrical charges through our hands and we become one, a synergetic field. And then in the middle is a, a, a column and then the on top of the column is a bowl and in the bowl are these white vapors coming down and there's a hologram of the earth again. And what they tell me is that they're the watchers and they've been watching the earth and that they will protect her and they're not going to let anything happen to her ever. And that I'm a part of that. I'm a part and I could come back anytime I wanted to be with them and be a be a part of this whole galactic system that's in place to help protect her. And uh, so I stay there, I don't know for how long, and they do kind of a, a guttural kind of a sound, a real low, like a Tibetan chant almost really beautiful really ecstatic and uh i'm there and then the gardening comes up to me and he doesn't say anything because i can't see his face and he's like it's hey it's time to go and so i say goodbye to them and then we uh start moving and the next thing i remember is going uh up these stairs and around and there's like a like a bridge like at the top and I look down, it's like a Victorian house, a humongous Victorian house uh, with the big white window panes. And But up at the top, it's opened again where you could see the stars. There's a jazz-like music and there's people everywhere, all kinds of different kinds of beings. I'm the only human that I could see. Uh, there was like a pink elephant. I remember him. <laughs> he was an elephant. I swear he was like a, a bright popsicle pink elephant that was talking with someone. There was one that looked like a, a teddy bear with a monocle. And he talked to me like a professor. He wanted uh, to see what it really looked like. It's like he had studied humans before and he actually got to talk with someone in their their native tongue. So he actually talked talk to me. And I still didn't have a body. And, and he was so excited about it. And, uh, and then the other person was like an admiral with these big square shoulders, but he had these gold admiral looking things on his shoulders. And and he had a, a little button, like kind of like a Star Trek thing, but that oh, yeah. he would <laughs> tap and that way he could uh, communicate with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, my garden stayed really close to me, but I felt like I was on display for everyone. And what they told me was that it was a galactic party an ambassador's party, and that they would meet to um, discuss and handle and work out different problems and 
uh, cr help create a peaceful future with all the different societies and whatever they're working with. And so I felt really honored to be there. Uh, and I'm a foodie, so I'm thinking, I wasn't hungry, but uh, they didn't eat food, but they had these tall vials of different liquid colors in primary colors that they would drink. And I thought that was pretty cool. But I couldn't drink because I couldn't see my body. But they did say, we love your smile. You have an amazing smile and we're so glad you're here. And so I said, thank you. But, you know, I was just totally um, like a, a view, like a perspective of a narrow, narrow view of everything. I had to kind of turn to see things. So, so I'm watching this and being a part of it. And I remember saying to myself that I had to remember this. It was really important that I remember this. And in that moment, I was having such a good time though talking with everyone, everyone was having a good time there, was very relaxed. And um, so then in just a heartbeat, he comes up to me, the guardian, and he says, it's time to go. And I start, we start kind of swirling around and out. And then we're swirling around in nothingness. And, and I'm kind of just swirling and dancing around, I'm having a good time. And, um, and then as I'm there, a group of women start to come towards me. And they're like Greek goddesses, the Greek thing again. We were talking earlier, Sharon Ann. And they're in jewel tone colors. There's some in turquoises and some in lapis and some in a bright orange and amber and they have beautifully enameled jewelry on and they have long hair some of red and blonde and and they're just beautiful all different uh different uh skin tones and they have instruments and they sing in in tone in a very high operatic like a siren voices mm -hmm. and they say their work with me is to help me find my voice and i couldn't leave until i did and I said, well, I, I'm an alto, okay? So there's no way I'm gonna be able to sing like you sing. And they go, well, but that if that's your voice, that's your voice. And so so I did find it and, and it was very low and, uh, and sang with them. And then he came to me, the guardian said it was time to go. And I didn't wanna go. I was having such an amazing time. I was so happy. Everything was so bright. I felt more alive in the afterlife or in this dimension than I had ever previously in on the earth plane. And so I really wanted to stay. And then he said, well, you have your children. And I go, oh my gosh, that's right. I have three children, I have to go back. And so then as we start to go back, um, we see a, a, my friend sitting at a, a, in a hospital, she's sitting on a chair and I'm thinking, what is Cindy, my friend, doing at this chair? And, and I look down and there's a body on the bed and and I, oh my God, that's me down there. But I, I didn't freak out or anything. I just said, oh, that's me laying down there. And I said, well, you know, you don't look so bad, but you look a little puffy girl. And so, so I'm <laughs> seeing my body there, you know? And so then I, I come up to him and I said, look, if I'm going to go down there, I'm going to need some help. And I really need you to give me something to help me to make it down there because it's pretty tough down there where I'm going back again after being where I've been and doing what I'm doing. You expect me to go from this state into this new state without any help? And he says, well, and I threw a fit like a little 10 year old. I really did. I did. It. <laughs> he thought it was so funny. He laughed. He started laughing. And I said, well, can I get like a, you know, a, a gel free card or a, a you know, a, a pass or just something. And he said, well, we will gift you the gift of white light. And I said, well, that's all you're going to give me. And I just, I'm just a little brat. And he gave me the gift of white light. I know what that is now, but I didn't at the time. And it is quite a gift. And so then I go, okay. And so I go to go down to my body and he says, oh, one more thing. And so I go back up again. We're floating in the corner of the room with my body down below and my friend in meditation there. And he says, before you go back, we would love for you to be a, an ambassador if you'd like. And I said, oh, yeah, I'll do that without thinking. Yeah, I'll be an ambassador. So as I'm going to float back down into the body, I'm thinking an ambassador, ambassador of love, an ambassador of the arts, an ambassador. What could he mean? And I look back and the guardian was gone. So then my next job is to acclimate 
myself down into the body. So I just acclimate in with all the white light that I am, my beingness, and I just acclimate into the body. It's like trying on new shoes, you know? And so I get back in to all, all of me, that is, into the body. And I kind of, I remember kind of wiggling a little bit to make sure it fit perfect. Um, and then it kind of like a click. And um, I sit up and I had the tubes in my mouth and I just said, I'm starving. I want some nachos. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome home. <laughs> Let's go to Taco Bell. <laughs> yeah, and so everyone was just blown away because I wasn't supposed to um, make it, you know, at all. And then to come back with this story and they did all the testing and I was totally fine. So that's, that's my story. That was 30 years ago. And I, try really try my best to not embellish or or take away or really do the best that I know how of, of having the story exactly how, how it happened. No, oh, well that sounds amazing. Do you know as, as you were saying it, you know, one of the things that I I never been able to get my head around is um like when you go out of the body, I imagine it's very similar or maybe the same as astral projection like basically your soul um even though there's still a tether of some type to the, the physical body you're basically going out into the astral and um but then and you're floating in this pool as you said I can understand that being the astral but when you then transfer yourself to the ship and to the beings and that are you still in the astral or is that actually real reality, like real reality? Like this is reality, but there's also another real reality elsewhere. It's, it's the way the best way I can explain it, it's another dimension where I exist, where I can exist, where mm. there's a lot happening, and mm. and where I I can be there as mm. well as be here. So it's almost like bilocate in a way. Yes. It's, and so it's kind of like I can leave some energy in my body. I didn't leave much because I was there wasn't much of me left. And I think I could only leave just a little bit in in order to have such an extraordinary experience. Yes. I had to have a lot of me on the other side, more me on the other side than running the body on this third dimension. So mm -hmm. that's my feeling on it, that I was more there than here. Yes. Well, that's how it sounded too. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, I suppose it's all phrasing, isn't it? It's like, um, I don't want to label things, but mm -hmm. sometimes, you, have, you know, it makes more sense to me now that you've said the word dimension, mm -hmm. you know, I can mm -hmm. actually visualize that a bit more. Mm -hmm. So most people who experience an NDA, Barbara Jean, refer to them as life changing, of course. Sure. So did you change your lifestyle in any way? Uh, and did you cleanse the people in your life? I, I, I notice a lot of the a lot of the time when I talk to people that have had, had NDEs, the first thing they seem to do is get rid of everybody from their life, from their circle, except for family, and even some get rid of family as well. And um, basically, it's like they've they're a walk in. You remember how I think it was Doreen Virtue that had, did the Earth Angels? Was it her or? think so and she she explained a walk-in is like a new person walks into the the body the physical body of another person but I find with a lot of NDE people they act like walk-ins um, after they've had their experience what was yours was it life-changing it was life-changing but I have to say I definitely was not a walk-in because when a walk-in comes into a body it has no memory or very little of what happened to that body previously now you and were returning yeah. I've returned, man, and I re-owned everything, right? And I was vitally alive with no filters, mm. okay? So no I filter. no <laughs> filters, okay? very little filters, all right? Mm. And so I was free, you know, and so I loved everybody. So I would, and I was kind of loving to start with, so it was like, you know, people, people started coming to my room. My room was the party room at the hospital where people would come and, and get joy and love and hear hear my story or I would help people. And the way it changes my, I had been studying psychic work before that, mm -hmm. but afterwards my psychic abilities turned on a hundred percent and I mm -hmm. couldn't shut them off. 
And so I had to learn how to acclimate that. So that was a big change for me. I would, you know, people would come in, I would know they were lying to me. I know that they were, I know what was up with. So I would just scan them, kind of scan them and know, read them, you know, and know what the truth is. And, and, but I really had this filter of no filters at all and, and really love everybody. That was a huge change. And I then I love the way you said that it makes, so much sense because that's that's what usually happens when you have an experience. You suddenly realize the bullshit of what well, you know well, trying to hide. Right. Things, right. Know? But I did have three kids. One son was uh, a, a teenager, and so it wasn't easy for them. They went through this transformation with me as well, yeah. and so we would walk into like a local at that time Seven Eleven store to get the kids a slurpee or something like that and i would read the person and the person would know i was a healer or a teacher or whatever i was i don't know what i was i was acclimating all right and so he would come up and just start crying or i would say your uncle bill is going to be fine i was no filters and an out of control healer okay mm. and so so it was like you know i was like this whirlwind you know coming in so uh it took me a long time to uh be able to to really be in the body again in a way that um was acceptable by others socially socially acceptable socially acceptable yes yeah. and so i i did uh finish my divorce with my husband that first year i uh closed my fine art gallery I closed my uh, design business. I moved my children to Marin County and I was going to go back to school, but I also dedicated my life to doing healings and readings for people. And I've done that for 30 years. So it totally changed me in just about every way, you know, possible. It was uh, just, uh, how do you put a, a whole gallon of you know, liquid love into a thimble. That's what it felt like, you know. And so um, um, it took some time. And I didn't know anyone else who had, had that experience. That was oh, part of the years ago, no. Yeah, it was 1989. There was no, uh, and, um, you know, I had to read. I'm a voracious reader still to this day. And so I tried to read as much as I could about the subject. And, um and learn through people that would come to me. And I had some amazing adventures afterwards. I traveled the world and, um, you know, it's just been a crazy wild ride for many, many, many years. And, um, but I'm, I'm doing what I came here to do and I found what that is. And it's really, it's about love. It's, we come from love, we are love and we return to love. It's, it's really simple in a way. But um, to walk that as much as I can, I try and do that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So did, did you do any further research on that ancient Egyptian being that played such a large role in the NDE? I did. I went to Egypt twice. Oh, um, wow. Okay. Yeah, one was uh, <laughs> by mistake or coincidentally was a writer's tour uh, oh. for writers only, and I didn't know that. So mm -hmm. I show up there and I'm... I don't have any of my stuff, so I learned there. Uh, but uh, I learned that I could be okay in Egypt and be there and not die, <laughs> number mm. one, uh, after having that experience. Mm. Um, and uh, and I went again the second time, and I had a whole nother experience. But recently, about, I don't know how long, it's funny, I'm not as good with linear time here, uh, but it was about, I'd say about a, maybe a month or so ago, it has taken me 30 years that I had a regression about that. And that was with Barbara Lamb. She's oh, a, okay. yes. yeah, she's a friend of mine and I trusted her to do it. And what we did is we went back in uh, during that fight for my soul because I wanted to know for myself too, because I had these other people telling me, but I wanted to find out for myself. And so that's where we started. And, I'll give you the short version of it. Um, the being was there in a, another timeline as well, is kind of what we saw, uh, and that he came down off a ship. He was huge, like 15 feet tall, uh, had kind of an Anubis head or an Anubis-looking oh, yes. Anubis mm -hmm. helmet on 
mm-hmm. with this gun looking, a very modernistic gun and came out and I was there as a leader with my people. That's how it came down. And, and I was telling them that they were okay and we didn't need to be afraid. And they came off the ships and annihilated everybody. And my yep. last memory with him was he was taking his, his whatever it was and putting it right through my heart. And so what we saw is that he was not only doing it during that time in 1989, but he was doing it through the timelines as well. Mm. Yeah, so it was really a kind of a tripped out story. And so I went back in then and worked on healing that and yeah. and forgiving him and forgiving myself for being an idiot for, you know, for taking these people with me. And so I worked a lot on that. And, and from having that one regression, um, my asthma got much, much, much better. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, it, it is amazing with the regression therapy how a lot of things, health issues, clear up. I I had a regression, oh, probably 10 years ago. And up until 10 years ago, I used to have this stabbing pain in my neck, mm-hmm. back of my neck on the, on the right-hand side. And it would play up every so often. And... I discovered in a regression, and I seem to have lived a lot of times from the amount of regression I had, I thought it would be like a 30-minute. It ended up being three and a half hours. Mm. And I went, I went, I actually went into a future life, which Ooh. proved me I had no idea there were future. You could do that. <laughs> and uh, I, we'll have a discussion on that at some point too because I'm sure you, you'd actually enjoy that one. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, basically in a past life, I think it was in Scotland or somewhere. Some um, somebody that I had trusted, great, you know, had great trust for, mm-hmm. had killed me by sticking a knife in the back oh, of. Me. Wow. And as soon as I had kind of realised that, you know, I've never had the issue since. And huh. it's a lot of people um, also that have addictions to things. I've been told. Uh, like smoking or eating or um, like I have a girlfriend that used to over, overeat and she, she she spent her whole, up until her 30s, overweight, like a good 10 to 15 kilos overweight the whole time. And she went and did a regression and she discovered that in um, 1940, she was in Germany and, you know, there was a starvation right. of German people after the war. Um not, not a lot of people realise a lot of German people, like millions of Germans died post uh, the mm. World War II uh, due to the embargoes that were placed on the country from uh, the US and UK and, you know, the Alliance at that time. And she was one of the starving German people who were, uh, and she starved to death. And basically, once she had done that regression, she then, within like a six-month period, she went to her BMI or whatever, we call it a BMI, which is uh, the actual ideal weight for the, her body shape, her body mass, body mass index, they call it, I think. And um, she's never been overweight since. So there's a, yeah, there is a lot to, to this regression therapy, which, um, you know, which, which people, and the same with uh, like, illogical reasons to fear things like spiders and or I I also had vertigo for years up until 2006 and then I I did the regression and I discovered that I had fallen from a high tower or being pushed I think I was I think I I think that mustn't have been very nice I keep I got killed a lot (laughs) it's it's quite funny Um, every time I did the Every time I went from life to life to life, I was thinking, oh, my God, why am I always getting killed by somebody? This is, like, I must have been a really bad person. Or, you know, and I've, I've got better. The last few hundred years, you know, I, I managed to. You know, the most amazing one for me was I was a dragon handler. Um, <gasps> How cool during, is that? During the Crusades. Which Whoa. I know, I know. So I had a wonderful experience as a dragon handler. And I didn't get killed by the dragon. Bonus. <laughs> wow. But yeah, so I think there's a there is a lot that could be unpacked from a psychological perspective on regressions for people that have addictions or have illogical reactions to certain things. You know, because I know it's I've had two things cured. 
through progression therapy, which, you know, were illogical, I suppose. They were, they were mental issues. They weren't um, uh, like phobias and that. So, yeah, so I think there's a lot to it. Yeah, um, and, and I think, too, the fear it took me, still after having the experience that I had, it still took me 30 years to get past that fear. Yeah. So that, and I'm a courageous person, you know, I really exactly. feel that I am. And so, but I came in with the asthma, I was born with it. So it's interesting, isn't it, how it all comes full circle and, and you just, awareness then dissipates that fear and, and voila, you have your miracles. So it's cool. Exactly. Uh, it, yeah, it's, yeah, there is so much to it. I mean, if I were to actually go into a clinical science, I would probably look into the, like some kind of psychology, psychiatry with regression as my main um, agenda with people because I think that's probably the next big frontier in psychology. It's um, getting to the root of those issues. I, I don't think they actually fix people at the moment with what they're doing. Um, um, psychiatrists basically just prescribe things that suppress and I think psychologists work that same way. They suppress it. They don't actually bring it out and... And I think that's what regret. That's the difference. Regression therapy actually brings it out into the open, lets people understand. Um, I think that's the trigger. It's like you understand why. And I think they've now proved that memories from previous generations are carried through in our cells. Mm -hmm. So what we're really doing is we're sat, we're actually coming to the you know, the realization that oh, we are our grandmother, we are our mother, we are right. we are our. Um, so basically, everything that they've experienced we're experiencing which and it does make sense why we all have these neurotic problems <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, thousands of years of neurosis has happened I mean, it would have been great to be the cave person back in the you know, early days no issue you know or occasionally something chases and eats you you know <laughs> Yeah, they would awareness be is empowering, though. I think having that awareness empowers you. See, you have choice then. When you have choice, then you feel like, you know. Yeah. And you realise how ridiculous it is for you to have a reaction to something that you, happened to your grandmother. You know right. what I mean? Right, right. I have a bit of a theory with these these modern feminists. Um, I don't call myself a feminist. Um, my grandmom, uh, mother, um uh, both my grandmother and my mother have been like the first wave and the second wave in England feminists. And um, if I were, that's my definition of a feminist. Uh, basically, they fought for our right to vote and to be equal. This current batch, I find very, oh, I don't know, I don't, they, I don't identify and I hate the way that they have taken the word feminism and changed it to, to suit this this hatred of everything that's not them and um so i think i think a lot of labels are being maligned now which used to stand for very good uh truthful things you know and that that annoys me greatly um but different if different broadcasts <laughs> <laughs> so anyway so what was the impetus for you to document your life in the autobiography dying for the light apart from the obvious nde itself did how old were you when you did that oh my gosh uh 2016 so um well, you I don't, don't know. share your age if you don't want to <laughs> i don't mind in my 60s in, so, yeah so basically you just thought well it's about time i wrote one <laughs> i did and, and it was kind of to help myself because i had it all over the place, scattered in different places, all over the place. Mm -hmm. So to put it in one place, I did it really for my grandchildren. So mm -hmm. they would know my story. And I wanted them to know that their grandmother that really happened and that um, for them not to fear, I don't want them, I want them to come in and do what they came here to be and do and, and to be free. And I feel like hopefully the book would be inspiring to them to um, to be that way, that it, it's in their blood, right? They can't help themselves. They got to, <laughs> they got to, you know, change some things that need to be changed here on the earth. So I, so I, I believe that's why I wrote it. And um, yeah, to, and also at that time to just be in alignment with uh, other people who had had near death experiences too, that, um, 
it was happening and it has been happening all through our history. And like, what is it? 744 people a day in the United States have near death experiences. So it's like, it's getting up there, you know, and with our uh, technology that we have now and uh, people are going to have more and more of this. So it's opening up uh, aspects to ourselves that maybe weren't available before. I See, I see an NDE as the mechanism to, to kickstart a vision quest. I think there's a lots of ways of going on a vision quest. Um, I went on one when I was quite young um, and it was purely through um, meditation. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of dabbling in astral projection and then one night I went on this, what I call a vision quest. And I'm, I actually met American Indians and um, it was kind of being thrown back into a past life. And there was, you know, I met my soul animal and things, you know, there, it was a very interesting experience. And because yours was so long, I definitely describe what you did, the NDE being the, the, the initiator of it. But I think a lot of people go on vision quests in different ways and some do it through meditation, some do it through astral projection, some do it through ritual, like an American Indian um, sitting there and or they use um, a psychotic of some type, um, else LSD or some some of the Peruvian more in, you know, un maligned <laughs> substances. Um, and I think in your case, it happened through an NDE. And I think the ones that are happening through NDEs are, um, you, you, they, they realize that you have to go on this journey, these other beings, but you're not getting there yourself. So I think they're kind of kickstarting you. They're, they actually, it's, it's a bit of a push to get you there. And whereas the others, uh, they'd, they'd be fortunate enough to grow up maybe in different environments where they encourage people to do this um, on, on their own. So um, that's kind of where I, I kind of see these these NDEs. Mm -hmm. but I, I'm amazed at your NDE because it went on for so long. I mean, um, most NDEs last up to 10 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, but very short. So, um, yeah, which is, I wonder if that's why you have, a greater memory of it, whereas a lot of people wake up and they just see the tunnel and they see people that that have already passed on. Whereas, um, did, did you see anyone familiar or just the beings? No, just those beings, no. But I do later, much later, realize that it's my family, it's my star family, okay. yeah. right? Yeah. When you have that aha moment, and that it wasn't a coincidence that I went on a spaceship. See, at that time, I knew nothing about, that was just not in my reality at all. But mm. now that um, on a spaceship, it was, that's where I come from, you know, it's from, uh, from that extraterrestrial is me on that yes. spaceship. And that's my family and that's my familiar. And I had to be, you know, reminded they go, hey, you're like, you're, you're thinking you're just here to work and, you know, and do all these things. And I was looking, but it, I must have not been doing it fast enough, you know, in a way that mm, I needed to get a job done in it. And I'm a part of a, of, of a puzzle of, of a whole plan, you know, of, of, of part of it is, is our relationship with the earth and with our, uh, the cosmos too. And, and coming up to speed with all of that. So I, I'm sure I'm a part of that somehow. Um, I also think, I, a lot of people, yeah, I think a lot of people get ill and get diagnosed with, you know, quite severe illnesses because again, they're going against where they should be going on their path. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of their illnesses kind of steer them back to where they should be um, or it's an NDE or something like that. And yeah, I just think it's a, there's a lot of severe kind of self-correcting going on. Yeah, <laughs> it'd be, yeah. It would be nice if that wasn't going on. I yeah. mean, <laughs> and I had came in with asthma, so I had, had already built a relationship with death. You know, your breath. You know, if you can't if you can't breathe, you're dying all the time. So I was I learned how to have a relationship with if I'm going to die, maybe this is the time. So I wasn't as fearful of it as probably as most people in some ways because of having severe asthma and going up with that. And then after this event, 
uh, a few years later, I ended up meeting coincidentally a Native American um, Indian chief, a Lakota Sioux chief, uh, Chief uh, Richard Sparrow Eagle, and I studied with him for eight years and learned of uh, the Lakota traditions. And so I feel like, like you were saying, the vision quest continued. They wanted to make sure. And so I think I went that far out there into the cosmos that I met him wasn't a coincidence to bring me way down into the earth because I had had the concept on the ship, but I didn't have it in 3D. So I needed to develop that kin kindred ship, that relationship again with the earth. and. And if anyone's wanting to do that, um, their traditions are so amazingly beautiful. So that sounds good. So have you, have you experienced anything similar to the NDE since 1989? Nothing. That, yeah, no, one's one? good. One's good. <laughs> but yeah. I did have my good friend. Well, not my good friend, a friend uh, and a, more of an acquaintance, but and a friend. He wrote the forward in my book, uh, Daniel Brinkley. And he told me, he goes, Barbara, Gene, he goes, just be ready because he saw me having at least two more NDEs before I actually pass. Okay, well, so hopefully they're not as painful this time. Oh, I hope not. And you don't have to, you're right, to get to, to have these experiences. Um, studying with, a, you know, a Lakota or studying in meditation or doing vision quest or uh, doing, working with a shaman and your Australia, your Aborigine shaman, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, you know. Um, that you can have these ultra dimensional experiences where you can go out and learn and then bring it back home, not only to yourself, then make it real and then share it with the world. That's about right. So um, obviously you're on Revolution Radio, um, a, a, a station that I support <laughs> yeah. like myself for a number of years. Um, now, your weekly show is called The Cosmic Oracle. Could you tell um, our listeners a little bit about it and what they might expect if they tune in one Friday? Oh, I, I've been doing it. I love it. I have great passion for it, and I get to choose. It's I, uh, We were talking earlier. It's like my art form that I get to pick and choose who I think uh, I would like, number one. No, just kidding. <laughs> who, who the people would like, but I'm hoping that if I think they have something of value to say that the listeners would. And we do a several things. Uh, number one, the number one purpose is for people to have a place to tell their extraordinary experience, whatever that is, however that is, and however that comes down. And then um, number two would be people who are taking their uh, message to the world somehow that whatever happened to them was something that was to be given as a gift to the rest of the world. So I try and work, uh, have people come on uh, a diversity and uh, from science to, um, uh, I have one of my favorites is a fairy, fae folk, that lineage. And uh, uh, it's a cross section. So it's that, it's part interview, it's part storytelling. And then sometimes at the end, depending, on how it goes, I'll do a free psychic readings as well. Oh, cool. That sounds wonderful. So, yes, I've been listening in to quite a few of your broadcasts. Uh, I've been downloading them from the archives. There's a wonderful archive area in Revolution Radio. And um, yeah, you've been, you, you certainly interview a diverse amount of people and from all walks of life and from, um, there are some mainstream in there, but majority non-mainstream, which is mm -hmm. more, Turn it, which is how I like to interview too, because <laughs> you never, never know what's going to be said, do you? <laughs> no, you don't. And I don't go according to how many hits they have or likes they have. No. I care. I don't care about any of that at all. No, so I'm it's mainly same. that they're authentic. They're mm. they're living their talk. They're walking their talk. That's the main criteria. Exactly. It's yeah. They're I call it. They're on mission. Yes. 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 If they're on mission, I want them. That's how I yeah. work in the magazine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So have you ever had a guest on your show, on the weekly show, that stood out from the rest? Um, is this the general we were discussing? Yeah. Yes, yes. Michael <laughs> Lee Hill. Um, Michael um, Lee Hill. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And it's michaelleehill.net. 
He's an amazing man, and he has an extraordinary story, um, and he shares it in a very eloquent way, and he's a musician, and uh, a, a very gifted musician, and uh, he had, how he came to no notoriety was that he just went out in his East Lake um, lake there in Ohio and took pictures of UFOs because it's something that he thought would be good and he it just started happening that they would show up and then he said well I'm going to play a little bit here I'm going to ask them to show up at sunset and they would show up so then he started developing a relationship with them so much so that they were just coming, he would show up and the ships would be there. And then he was getting downloads from them so much so that when I just talked with him on the show a couple of weeks ago, I've had him on twice or three times actually, he uh, had uh, five over 5 million hits on his UFO uh, series that he got picked up on the History Channel. But that's, that's just the beginning of his story. His story just keeps going. He, finds that his father is a very famous guitarist um, and it, it, you'll have to check him out. And then he ended up making these amazing things. He finds out that he is the water bearer and he's inky and he, he's 100% Iroquois. And he had been adopted. He had no idea that wow. he was Iroquois at all. He met two sisters that he never knew existed and his life just keeps going and growing. It's, it's a tremendous interview. It has nothing to do with me as much as it has to do with his his mission. And he's extraordinary. He really is an extraordinary man. And his uh, fiance is a beautiful being and they have a lot to give and, and there's someone to watch out for because it's gonna go big time for them with their message as well. Oh good. It's, it is that synchronicity of events uh, sometimes takes your breath away, doesn't it? I've, I've had that happen to me a few times in life, and um, one time I'll, sh I'll share it quickly with you with yourself. Is I had uh, been living in Sydney. I moved from Brisbane to Sydney, and I was down in Sydney for about four or five years, and I'd lost track of my my brother. There, there's there's about a six year age difference between us, so he'd always been that it was just that too big a gap, you know, that we weren't friends. We were just siblings and when when I was at school he was basically out in the workforce and didn't he moved out you know in those days you moved out of home about 18 you know so I didn't see much of him as I was growing up basically in Australia um we we, we came over here when I was about 13 and um so the last few years basically while I was putting my head down in study he was out in the workforce already so I went to Sydney after uni and um I was down there for about five, maybe six years, and then I came back to Brisbane. And I hadn't seen my brother for a long time because um, he, he basically had been roving around. He, he was very much a gypsy elements in, in of his psyche. So uh, he'd kind of ring my parents and I'd probably speak to them and they'd say, oh, I think he's around here or he's around here, you know, but that's about all that happened for about a, a, probably an eight year period. And um, so I got back to Brisbane and I I got back and all my friends were either married or um, basically had changed groups. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I've got no friends left in Brisbane. Basically, they were either overseas or they were getting married or they'd had kids, for God's sake, so early in those days. And um, so they, I, I thought, oh, I better get myself a new friend group here because, you know, there's only a couple of key people left. And so I, I joined a group called Rotaract, which is like, I don't know if you have that in the States. It's, do, you, do you have Rotary? Okay. It's kind of like uh, you do charity, but mm. you're also a social group. And Rotaract becomes Rotary. Uh, when you pass 28, you move into Rotary. And Rotary is more of a, a bigger organization. Oh, and yes. Rotary. Yes, of course. Yeah, Rotary. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, that's for the young person's. Uh, Rotor, it's called Rotaract. And um, so I thought, okay, I'll give that a go. I'd gone to a few of the meetings of a friend in Sydney. That's how I knew about it. And then when I came back, I actually joined the local group up here. And I've, I've made friends for life, which was which has been great. And um, 
any one of the people that I met was uh, a, a young uh, girl. I think her name was Claire. Um, I've got my bre- my memory now is just gone, and um, and we got on really well. And so for the next couple of years, um, she and I became besties, and we we did a lot together. And and she was um, she'd been engaged to this this guy for uh, oh about a year into our friendship. She started going out with this guy. Uh, called Bob and I thought to myself um, but Bob was always um, out of state on work he was more of a salesperson and you know every time we we tried to organize a get-together he was always out of state or I didn't turn up you know that it was two years to the day we organized to finally all have like a group thing at a restaurant and um, I was finally going to meet Bob and um, so we're sitting there in this Chinese restaurant and um, my brother walked in and I'd always known him as Robbie, Robert. And it was her fiance. Oh my goodness, that's Believe awesome. And, that's and awesome. It, it was the funniest thing because the whole group of friends were there. So it was probably about 30 people in this restaurant. We'd taken over the place and my brother walked in and I got up and he got up and we hadn't seen each other for almost 10 years. Oh, and wow. we just and we just embraced and hugged and kissed and and my friend who has no concept of who he is to me <laughs> and everyone's sitting there like absolutely aghast. Act, oh, right? <laughs> God. And she's there saying, What the hell are you doing? <laughs> I, I'm hugging my brother. And she that's when everyone, oh, my god <laughs> it was huge so wow that yeah. is synchronicity and that happens constantly you yeah. know so, and yeah. like that was probably the most extreme version for my 20s I think um yeah so yeah so how about that and when you were talking before it just reminded me of that you know how things just sometimes happen you know and like that that was probably uh two years in the making you know to get to that right. point Right. Yeah. And it's just all set up. You just walk into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Amazing. So, so um, look, something that really appealed to me was the fact uh, you co-owned the infamous, I sh- I'm going to say famous, not infamous, um, Integratron. Ugh, I've never been able to pronounce this. Integratron? Integratron. Integratron. I've always, for some reason, I have a right. problem. To, uh, is it normal <laughs> what people do? Now you had it for about yes. five years. So, five years. I, so I thought that was, are you one of the Carl sisters? I am not one of the Carl sisters, but she was my best friend during yeah, the time. I, that yeah. makes more sense, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We, so, yeah, we we had went there. It was with the husband I had at the time. And we were uh, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend. And he used to go there to the Integratron and they would meet once a month and do all day uh, meditation and hands on healing work there. Mm -hmm. And he knew the owners and I met the the Carl sisters and we got along great. And uh, we got a call. So I had been going for several years to the Mm -hmm. Integratron. So it became, you know, part of our once a month, we would go there and and meet up with our tribe there and, and we would do healing work and meditation and, and you just fall in love with the place. It's a really, amazing um healing zone and and it 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 just is a you can feel the air in there crackle you can feel you know like when you're in a place that just you know oh, something yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah it's crispy it's like crispy there <laughs> <laughs> and so um the, we got a call from the girls and they said we're going to go in with um 15 other people and buy the integratron would you like to come in and, and do that with us? And we said, well, I don't think that 15 people could ever get anything done. Mm-hmm. Um, so how about just the four of us do it? Mm-hmm. And we'll just, you know, pay for half of it. And so we did. And oh, uh, we yeah. started working together and we did a lot of, uh, it was in really bad shape. So we did a lot of cleanup and a lot of work. And um, And during that time, we were building a house in Santa Cruz, California, where I had a healing center for eight years. And um, so we lived there at the Integratron for, I think it was almost three months mm-hmm. on the property itself. And it was never designed for anyone to really live there for a long period of time. But 
the girls now one of the girls do do live there maybe two of them live there now but we were the first kind of to do that and what happens when you're there I'll tell you one story with it mm -hmm. is that I'm there with my kids I have the three kids and usually there's a couple other kids that are hanging out with my kids so we have the kids and we were doing teenage uh, meditation classes there as well and we didn't go off property for about 30 days because we were painting it, we were working on it, and you just it, and it's quite a drive to go into town, and it's like 170 billion degrees out, you know, yeah. so, <laughs> so you just don't go out, right? So it had been like 30 days, so we decided that it was time to go into town and maybe get some lunch and celebrate. So there's like 15 of us, and at the time we owned a bus, a large city bus that we had revamped. <laughs> because when you work with kids, they're, all their cars are breaking down. So it was either easier for us to have a bus, and we took the kids to sun dances and a lot of the native uh, Star Nations traditions and uh, took them all there. So we got on the bus and went into town to this little place called Jack's. It's a hamburger place there. We all went in and sat down at this one big table there and everyone's doing their business and they don't wait on us. And then they don't wait on us and we're talking and we're carrying on. Right. And they don't wait on us. And I'd say about 25 minutes, no one comes to the table. And then a lady comes up to me. She goes, hello. And we're going, hello. How are you? And she goes, fine. She goes, what's your order? And basically she said, we weren't there. She just saw us. Wow. We there. When we said we had gotten there, she didn't believe us. She said, No, I we said, No, we've been here for a half an hour. She goes, No, you 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 just got here. She said, no, we've been here for a half an hour. And the only thing we could think of is that there is, you know, the vibration was so high. We were we had sang on the way, we had meditated, we were all in a just a really amazingly great space all of us together as a unit you know not one person was in a bad mood or anything we were all united and I think the energy just went way up that they just didn't see us yeah and you can you can actually float above your head I've, I've I've done that a few times I do it after I do sky watches and we've done meditation um, on a mountain or something I do a lot of um, ET kind of c5 work and which means basically mm -hmm. I um, freeze my butt off on a mountain you know, uh, for about a five-hour <laughs> period, and we there's probably a good three hours of meditation. And I notice the next day I have um, high strangeness everywhere, and mm -hmm. and I start talking to people and they don't talk back to me. Yeah, so that's it. That's it. Yeah. Now I, <laughs> that helps me now understand. Uh, I've actually I had my second. Um, I had my first encounter with a mantis being in that mm. state, mm. and. Um, it was actually quite a funny one. Um, they got quite miffed. I was at it was I was at a petrol station filling my car up with petrol, <laughs> and I just done a C five the night before, and I'm floating because you are you float aren't you? You're right, kind of right. floating away, and I'm kind of singing to myself in my head, and then suddenly I turn around and this this bike this black bike um, walks uh, drives in and parks right behind me. And the creature on it is so skinny. Everything is, but the leather, clad leather, but skinny, like more than I've ever seen in my life. Anyway, it gets off the bike, takes off the helmet, and there's Voldemort, basically. It's a Voldemort look, you know, and kind of, um, anyway, and he's starting to fill up the, the bike with petrol. And then suddenly, and everyone's walking past, and no one's seeing him as he is. He's, they're obviously seeing this facade, whatever he's putting out. And but I am I'm standing there pumping gut and I'm looking right at him and thinking oh okay and like I'm so chill at this moment it does nothing <laughs> could have fazed me and then suddenly he looks at me kind of looks up and he kind of looks and telepathically he kind of goes you know you can see me and I go and I'm telepathically back going yeah but don't don't worry about it I'm used to this you know <laughs> and I and instead of just accepting it he got really miffed about oh he got upset that he wasn't strong enough to block it oh it yeah yeah up. and That's the funny thing the next thing i remember i'm in my car and i'm 10 minutes down the road the wrong way home oh he got so peeved oh. he kind of showed you <laughs> 
And I'm just like, oh, you dickhead, you know. <laughs> you dickhead. I just, that's it's like, so it's, it's funny now, looking back, yeah, because, yeah. you know. I don't know, maybe he was having a bad day. We all have bad days. <laughs> <laughs> we <laughs> caught him off, off guard, that's for sure, right? Yeah, yeah but, uh, I know exactly what you're saying when you say that that, that space, mm -hmm. the, 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 you know, you're, you're flying above it. Mm. So, um, I, I think I got, the reason why we had the Integratron too is I did a lot of research while I was there about mm -hmm. the 50s and the background of, you know, of of ufology here in the United States. Oh, and I wouldn't yeah. have done that if I had yeah, not. Huge down. Yeah, Joshua Tree, yes. you know, that whole area. As soon as, as soon as I read that about you, I knew exactly what you were talking about. I knew what you'd bought and everything because I've done, I'm um, being a ufologist. I know all about Joshua Tree mm -hmm. and I know that. And you're, you're like 20 miles from Joshua Tree too. You must have had high strangeness and ET sightings off the scale there. It, you know. it, it it became just like and and also it's a very international site so we always had people jumping over the fence and so you didn't know and they were usually from a foreign country didn't yes. speak very good english <laughs> <be me>. so, <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't believe the places I've broken into, Barbara. <laughs> yeah, so we, we had quite a bit. And and they, one story with Yogananda, when Yogananda came to visit there, he um said he had told the, the previous owners that it was on a crystal bed there. And that's why the energy was so strong there, too. And, and they really did. It was meant to be a healing um, modality, a healing machine. And you walked in one door stayed for 10 minutes with kind of the tesla coil it's like a tesla coil there and then you walk out the other side uh rejuvenated and hopefully the plan was 10 years younger but everything was stopped there so and they built the largest military base right next door to it so that's not a coincidence right oh, yeah know. yeah and, and the biggest space is probably way below it too you know right. what you're looking at on top it's nothing compared to what they've probably got underground there seriously. right and so, um, quite a few experiences there in giant rock and crystal hill oh, and nice. uh yeah one of my future stops a lot of that that area probably a good three weeks just there <laughs> yes 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 so um after 25 years as a spiritual teacher and four years on air helping people with their supernatural experiences you must have had a number of epiphanies about life um the universe and everything and not 42. <laughs> what would be the top three essential truths that everyone on earth should be aware of um i that were amazing that were extraordinary that's mm -hmm. number one i think it's important and that we love ourselves yeah just just the way we are if we can come from that love base we came from that love we are that love we return to that love if we can just not be so hard on ourselves we're so hard on ourselves in we so are. many ways if we could just tell that stinking thinking to stop and go back to the love part just reset to the love part reset to the love part it'll change everything uh, i think that's the number one thing uh, number two is to let go to really let go and and you really can't control anything really once you get to know that so uh you might think that you do and you're really busy and that keeps you really busy so let go there's that part if you let go there's a whole new world within this world that you can live in and you can be here at the same time but it's where it's more of an intuitive let go it's a little bit what i found is more feminine it's a feminine way to live it's soft mm -hmm. it it moves it flows like the river and if you can just trust sink into that trust a little bit um it just your life will be sweeter and you'll remember uh this planet the way it was way back in the day mm -hmm. and the third thing would be to redream a new dream mm -hmm. And not only personally, but to remember and then as a collective to, we can have peace on this planet. We can clean this planet up. It can be a paradise. We can 
do all of these things and not just in our minds. It's going to have to take action, action, dedication, responsibility, and all of the above. But, but it's, it, it's counting on us to show up. Mm. So there's no spectators like, you know, in this life, you, you got to come in on it. And I guess there's a fourth one, find your, find why you're here. That's probably number one too. find why you're really here. We're all here for very different reasons. And then once you find out why you're here, find your tribe and work with them. So. Exactly. Yes, that's that's so true. Um, when you say let go, also let go of fear, hey? Like, yes, exactly. Which is the biggest thing that holds us back from doing, yeah. accomplishing our missions. Yeah. I think that's why I taught firewalking. And that's the coincidence like you were talking about where I had a client who yeah. asked me if I would go with her long coincidentally story and when I went with her I didn't know it was teaching fire walking and we would be walking on a 108 foot fire and all these things happening and I had never been on walked on fire before I had no desire to walk on fire it does. So, but <laughs> what I learned was how to have a relationship with fear and that's what fire walking is about because fear is right in your face up close and comfortable and either you uh, talk with it, work with it, and then make a decision, you know, how you're gonna handle it. Now with, with fire walking, the key to fire walking is that you want to bring your energy up so it's equal to and greater than that of the fire before you walk. And that's kind of like it is in life. If you have a challenge or something, bring your energy up be there fully present, be fully present here. It's so cool to have a really vital life. I mean, vitally alive and you can taste things and feel things and enjoy things to their utmost, you know, don't settle for just being, you know, mostly dead. Yes. Yes. Which sadly is what most people do at the moment. So which interviewees have you had the most fun with on air? Okay. I, I was thinking about this. I have several because I like to have a good time when I'm on the air. I just recently had Karen Swain from Australia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah but I was on her show. Oh, so yeah. that, one, that one wouldn't count. But, oh, um, it would be, I had this amazing lady. Uh, her name's Hallow Quinn. It's halloquinn.net. And I don't know how I'm uh, how we came to be but she teaches all about the fairy and the fey folk and oh, she, yeah. I had she, Karen Kay have you done Karen Kay yet no I have to have her then I yeah, have to she's yeah. she a magazine and she was she was a delight delightful uh, lady yeah. I, there she and she did a, um, a meditation for everyone and took them to visit the fairy queen and oh she's just and she walks her talk. It's her life. It's she breathes it. She's she is it. And so I had the best time. I felt like a ten year old, you know. And she's an amazing storyteller. Like you know that art form of storytelling. She yes. has it down. She just takes you right <laughs> there. It was awesome. So I that for me is one that really stands out. Is her for sure. I you know it's funny. I I always used to say in the magazine fairies were my line in the sand. I wouldn't go to fairies and <laughs> it, I, it is kind of like I must have kind of said that so many times that out there they went right let's throw it at her and <laughs> within about a month I had three people um, approach me with photos of, of real life fairies <laughs> so, and oh. I, had, I had to actually you know, accept the fact that there was such a thing as the Fae. And, um, yes, yes. You know, I mean, the photos were, were ba you know, you couldn't dispute them. It was, and I, everything that goes into the magazine goes off to uh, a photographer friend of mine who, who teaches at a university and he qualifies everything. And basically he came back and he, he finds me particularly annoying because he's <laughs> grounded in logic and, I sent him things. I've sent him four things now over the last six years that he hasn't been able to say are, are fake or anything or show any problem with, and he hates that. He he always he says it's not logical. He says it's not logical that you could send me this, 
And I said, but is it real? He says, I can't. And he'll do all the wording to basically say, yes, it is real, but he won't. He won't actually say that. Do you know what I mean? He'll say, yeah, yeah. well, it doesn't have this or this or this. So I said, so that means it's real, doesn't it? You know, and he goes, well, you could say that. He still won't actually, <laughs> yeah, even though he'll, he'll, he's, he's proved it, it's good enough to go into the magazine. Yeah, it's in his face. To, you know, <laughs> but he won't actually, he, he's still in that denial camp where oh. most of the world sadly still is. Um, but I do, I do enjoy him as a person because you need you need people like that in your life. Not not twenty four seven. You can't live with people like that if you're in our kind of world. But um, occasionally they're they're good fun and they keep you. They kind of balance you. I think that's the word. You know. Yeah, we it, we have to have the fun, the joy yeah. part. We can't lose that. No, you know, we really can't. So if we lose that, we're in really trouble because the vibration goes way down well, and I think so is, yeah this is why a lot of people shed friends when they have their awakening or mm -hmm. i hate using that that word personally but when people do wait because being woke now is they they kind of bastardized that phrase haven't they um and i like it's now got more of a political kind of thing which i hate about it mm -hmm. but um, i find a lot of people that say they're 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 woke or whatever um there's words that's just words right it's it instead of ridiculous mm -hmm. you know, phrasing mm -hmm. is that, that like once you've had a you you've woken up to um a different reality i suppose of our world um the first thing a lot of people do is they shed their negative friends or their more grounded friends and um i mean in certain cases you um my my personal view is yeah you shed the more toxic that's in your life mm -hmm. you should do anyway and most people do periodically anyway but you should it, just because they're logical and you know n not in our sphere um you know of a what of of that state um doesn't mean you get rid of them it just means you maybe use them more as a balancing board and don't interact with them maybe as often you know but you you know i still think you keep that balance in your life otherwise you might go off the deep end in a way and yeah. go right into woo woo land like a yeah. balloon flying out <laughs> yeah. I, i'm sure that's why i had three children with me to come back into <laughs> i didn't have time to go way out there maybe from 5 15 to 5 30 but that's about it because i had to be a mom and take care of my kids and do a good job and be a part of the community and and do all of that which i did and i still continue to be a part of it so it's uh yeah it's uh it is definitely a balance but i found that i can be anywhere it doesn't matter and i don't even have to say what i do you know i'll go i can be at a ball i can be at a rock concert i can be at a opera i can wear it all it's really really fun i love the diversity and a lot of times i don't tell people what i do you know it's that i don't have to but also people will come up to me and say what do you do because they know something's up and they can't quite sure put their finger on it and then that leads me into i'll get a okay should i tell the story or not you know <laughs> and then sometimes it's like tell the story and you know and then i don't want to tell the story tell the story you know and no i don't want to tell the story but not very often so yeah you you probably you probably have what i have too where if I, I stay away from shopping centers and things and places where there's a lot of people because um i don't know it just gets a little draining very draining actually but i find if i sit down in a shopping center if i, if I keep moving in a shopping center and i actually take time to sit down people will just come and sit next to me and <laughs> tell me the most bizarre thing personal <laughs> thing about themselves it's and true it's true it's just and like you just kind of like, you know, I expect it now, but in the early days of it, and I understand why they're doing that, but mm -hmm. that's why I keep on the move now. If, if I'm going to a shopping center, basically I have an agenda. I know where I'm going and basically I'm in and I'm out. And, you know, they still get me when I'm queuing up to buy, pay for right. something. Right. And they, they, you know, but in the early days, I used to sit down to have a coffee. And even if I've got somebody across from me, somebody at the next table will start talking to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, 
and tw- an hour later, you know, <laughs> they had their, they're feeling a lot better and they're walking away and I am like a shell. <laughs> You know, it's just like, oh, my God, where did all my energy go? It's um, so, uh, but, yeah, do you, I imagine you're very much that way too. Well, I'm, I, I, I'm not anymore. I think I used to be, but I'm not anymore so much. I don't mind going. I, I probably not my first choice to go, but, um, <laughs> but if I do have to go, I really like watching people. And I like seeing. Oh, I do. I love people. I, I really too. like to see where they are and what they're doing, and 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 I do see that I am different, but I'm also I'm them and they're me, and so I can just kind. Of, I kind of enjoy it now. Mm-hmm. It's is that I just kind of found my peace with it, I guess, in some ways. But it's a uh, oh gosh, and and there's uh, it's it is a separation there though. There is somewhat of a separation I must say that is there as well I have um I've been told I have this uh other stare which is when I am walking around I kind of have I zone out I have a zone out stare where I can Mm -hmm. sit I can my neighbor who I'm very good friends with um and I she has a huge family of brothers and sisters and I know all of them really quite well and um they they've said to me at family events that I've been invited to. You know, we saw you at the centre or somewhere or in town the other day, and you stared right through me, and we were within a metre of each other, and you didn't even acknowledge that I existed. Oh. And I've had that so many times, and I think what I've done now is I because I've had to be out in public, but I and people do harass. It's not harassing, but it's kind of like a. a I suppose it's before I, I understood about protection and protecting myself right. with things. Right. And I got to the point where it was like, God, I'm so sick of not being able to function because people steal my energy all the time. Mm-hmm. So um, kind of like this vampiric thing was going on. And I understand they need it because um, they, they they haven't had certain things in their life to get them to where where, so where we are, I suppose, in a, in a way. And I'm not saying that from an ego perspective, but um, but like, it was like you were saying before, we, some people vibrate at different levels right. and the high, higher the vibration. I'm sure your vibration is very high. And it, I think it can I'm, be, and then it can be <laughs> low too. <laughs> but I, I, just, I just find that um, I think this stare develop that I have um, – where I don't even realize I'm doing it, and yeah, as I said, it's uh, I've got a very aloof people might I suppose view me as a bit aloof, then I'm not really, it's just I've just it's a protection mechanism, and um, thank god I've learned about real protection now, right, you know, so when right. those places I do the whole visualization with the white light, or I use golden light these days. I had I had a wonderful dream about this golden world um and this wonderful open air bridge which was paved with gold and stuff and from that from that dream i've now i got told that i should be using golden light have you heard of gold i like that yeah gold's always good i i like gold (laughs) i'm a gold i like i like pink a lot and then last night in the middle of the night i had this whole group of beings um um around my bed and they were having kind of a party with me and I just got the last part of it. And what they did was something amazing. It's something that I love. I've never been to India, but where they do that beautiful colored powder, you know, the different colors. I just think that's so gorgeous. And they were doing this with green, all that green, I uh, that beautiful emerald green around my bed. And that's the last thing I remember with them, but it was like. Oh, <laughs> oh well, I wear a lot of pink as you can tell. So. Yeah. Yeah, kind of like that's your color. <laughs> yeah, you find your color. I think for me it's emerald green because of my experience, but it, I also always gravitate. I think my favorite color is turquoise. It's always been turquoise, and that might be the Atlantean part that you were talking about, too. Yeah. Well, I think the heart chakra is emerald green and pink, isn't it? Yes, yes, both. Mm. Ah. Mm. So, um, so in as simple a sentence as possible. What is consciousness to you? Okay. Well, I, you <laughs> okay. I, I, if I could, I wrote it in my book. 
And I, it's my own view of it. And so um, in the back of Dying for the Light, it's a, a small uh, glossary. And I, I didn't look at anything. I just not channeled it, but looked at my own view of what I thought they were. And so um, for consciousness, I wrote simply, the everyday state of being in which you are awake and aware of yourself and your surroundings in relationship with yourself, the earth and the cosmos. Okay, that's great. Yeah, that's it. That is it in a, a nutshell. That's great. So it's just simple, you know, it's just, it's, it's and another way of saying it's kind of aware of being aware. Mm. Or so, being present. And being fully present. That's right. Yeah. I hate using that other phrase, which has become overused, mindfulness, you know. Oh, this oh it has nothing to do with it. <laughs> no, I know. People don't get that, though. They, I, it's funny. I started a mindfulness course at my daughter's school. Um, but I noticed they advertise it for parents, a three-week course, and they, they do this occasionally at the school. Um, this was two years ago. And I thought, oh, look, that's amazing. The school's offering this. I think I'll go along. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, within 10 minutes of sitting down, I was ready to leave because it was right. completely not what mindfulness was. And mm -hmm. and I actually voiced my opinion at one point and every, it was like the opposite of being accepted. It was like, ooh, what is she doing here? <laughs> challenger, you rule breaker. <laughs> so I, I didn't go back for uh, the second and the third and... Um, and realize that, yeah, I, I should stick to my own tribe. <laughs> so, because that tribe didn't want me at all. So. Uh, no, yeah. Funny. Yeah. So, I'm often told by people that we're all telepathic beings on Earth and we've just forgotten how to activate our abilities. And, and I've previously had telepathic um, communication with both a grey and also with a mantis. So, I know that that's probably how it's done out there. From your knowledge base, um, can every human being activate telepathy? We it, we can do it. We've just forgotten how. Is that is that your experience? I, I, I believe so. I really do. I I believe we came in with that. That is part of our inherent gift, and we just need to exercise it. It's like exercising a muscle. It's really now. There's going to be people that like a Mozart. There's Mozart people in this field, and then there's the ones that they really have to struggle to get it. So you'll have that variance for sure. But I feel like everyone has a talent and that talent is, it can be the telepathy for sure. I think that's where we're going. Hopefully that's where we're going as a species is, is telepath. And the more we can practice it amongst ourselves, um, find a partner and, and telepath with that partner. A lot of uh, people who are married, you know, where they become looking like one person and they have this telepathic charge. The same with the mother, with their child, of course. Me, I have a, a little rescue dog, Mary Margaret, and her and I, man, we are telepath. We, she, <laughs> I mean, it is clear, as clear as can be. And so I really do believe that, yes, we are all telepathic. And I really... Hopefully, I, it will be great because you can say so much with uh, telepathy. It reminds me of fine art, you know, like when you make a painting and, and um, you know, there's 10,000 words in that one painting and a telepath in that one painting would be 100,000 words mm -hmm. or, or pictures or feelings. Mm -hmm. There's a, a feeling with the telepath too. It's not just mind or visual. There's also a heart connection and a feeling part of that modality too. I think we're just on the new frontier of really uh, remembering that and how it all works. It, I see te um, telepathy coming in as the end of crime as well, because you'll mm -hmm. be able to identify, I suppose, you know, not to get too biblical, but what what an evil person is. You'll be able to sense it instantly. I mean, we all, we all sense it from certain people now, but... Um, we don't act on it, but telepathy yeah. will kind of rip back the, um, you know, the Band-Aid in a way. Yeah, oh. yeah. and, and it, it's um, to activate it and to use it. We just need to use it, that's all. And have, some of us are waiting for permission to use it. Well, don't. Just do it. 
I know what you're saying about the animal connection. I have that. I've got a cat called Chester who is beautiful, <laughs> and she and I have at times had full-on communicate, you know, discussions. And people just look at me when it, when it's happening, and it's kind of like, okay, gotta stop looking weird. <laughs> they're, they're, they're gonna, it's kind of like people that also talk to plants. I mean, I talk to plants. I you do know, too. Things. Yes, of that, course. That's telepathy, really, isn't it? Yes, you know? my babies. They're my babies. <laughs> I touch them. They they want me to touch them. I like them, you know. And I play music for them. They like Mozart. That's this little plant here, Peggy. That's her favorite. So. <laughs> so, so you already know I'm a huge fan of Contact in the Desert yes. and it's in the top three events I need to attend in the next five years. Uh, you host the Cosmic Cafe Experiences Gathering at Contact in the Desert, which I believe is a collaborative space to share personal extraordinary stories from paranormal contact with non-human intelligence and UFO sightings to out-of-body experiences and the altered states. That's straight from the website, by the way. What I wrote that. The, Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> what has been your most rewarding experience over the past five years of hosting uh, the Cosmic Cafe? What is there one that stood out that basically floored you that came out? Um, I don't think there's one. You think there would be? I don't have one. Isn't I? I see it as a collective, and that is when people come in if they can break through that fear, and I do energy work, you know, to help them get there, you know, and so when they come in to see them so um, they can be restrictive or, um, and to see them just open up is so beautiful just by telling their story and being heard in a safe place that they, a, a lot of the people cry, there's a lot of crying, it's mm -hmm. the first time they've ever told their story to anyone ever. There'll be people that come that were not going to tell their story, that tell their story. There are people that didn't know they had a story that mm -hmm. tell a story. Yeah. So it's a beautiful place. And, um, and my work is to just set the energy and have it, um, it's, it's like a temple you know, where people come and gather for a healing and an exchange of information. So, so it, it, it's a one-on-one -on -one experience. One -on -one. It's, a, it's one on one with the group and it has grown when I, I got that in meditation. I called Victoria. She's the one who runs it. And I said, it's a long story how I got to her, but she happened to pick up the phone coincidental. And I said, I have this idea in meditation that I feel like we, I love contact in the desert. And I just feel like where are the people telling their stories? The real contactees, why aren't they represented? I really think they need to be represented. And here's my idea, it's a cosmic cafe. And she loved it. I wrote everything out, sent it to her, and that's how it started. And she went with me, she had never heard of it before. No one it hadn't been, it had been done, but more secret and in the back door. And I yeah. wanted it out open. We have nothing to hide. This is a beautiful thing. And it's a learning exchange. And where one of us go, we all go together. And so it, it, uh, so it started out very small and then it got huge. We would have like 150 to 200 people show up to one. And mm -hmm. then we had to break them down. That's why they're broken down uh, to uh, uh, four this year. And so, um, and you can have any kind of story. They're not split up or anything. So whatever story. And if you come, then we just ask that you sit and help the the others tell their story and hold the energy for them. So there aren't many rules or anything like that, but it's uh, while someone else is talking that you hold the energy for, for them to tell their story. And what we have been to is opening it up a little bit. It depends on how many people are there. I've worked a lot with people from 10 people to, you know, I think the biggest was 350 people at one time, uh, rebirthing 350 people at one time with two other teachers. And so I've worked a lot having, you know, where you're just made to do this. I was, I was just made to do this. And so I'm there. And so what we do is uh, we'll go with, depending on the group, really the structure of the group, I'm able to kind of read it and see it. 
uh, anyone can do that. I mean, any psychic can do that. And um, and so as I'm sitting there, then I'll just kind of um, then after they've said their story, it depends. But uh, other people I'll ask them, this is what we're talking about. Tune in to your intuitive. What is there something you would like to add? Is there something you'd like to ask? Is there something that you might have in exchange with her? And we've been doing that. So now it's not only telling your story, we're actually really connecting people. Mm. Oh, it's really cool. It's really, yeah, so it's, yeah. it's evolving <laughs> itself. You know, we're starting and it has its own life to it, which is really gorgeous. And then this year will be the fourth year. It's my first time I'll be doing a lecture there. So oh, yay! So I'm excited about that. So yeah, yeah. so come, mm -hmm. come and tell your story and, and um and feel good about it you know oh, <laughs> or get some direction or get an aha but get a step forward you're not stuck you can take a step forward whatever that's going to be and it'll be in a positive way i think that's great um i've noticed i stopped going to our local ufo group here because uh i I noticed a lot of newbies would come and then they would never come back because it was too intimidating, that kind of forum. So what you're putting forward there, I think is perfect. Um, yeah, we need to do something like that over here. Um, I also um, find a lot of groups, a lot of group stuff becomes too political and that puts people off. Yeah, we're not, it's, it's real simple. I keep it real simple and we do it in a circle. So it's a circle too, a circle. So there's no hierarchy. We all bring something very important to the table. We all show up, we're there and we're accountable. And we all bring something to share. So. Oh, sounds good. No, I think you're <laughs> on the, yeah, I definitely think you're onto the right thing there. Especially if it's been going for, is it, so this is the fifth year. Oh, I forget. I don't know if it's the fourth or fifth, something like that. I think it's the fourth, it could be the fifth. Isn't that terrible? I don't remember. No, no, no. <laughs> I, think, I think you're right actually, so. so you, <laughs> You have turned your already prolific hand to writing and are now the author of three books, I believe, and you've also done a story in a, a, a further fourth book. Uh, we've already discussed your autobiography, Dying for the Light. Would you tell us more about Seized by Sekhmet and oh. the White Light Med Meditation, Expand Your Consciousness? And hold your books up if you have them there so we can see okay. what they look I, You know, I, I looked for my other one and I couldn't find it, but... Um, the white light meditation one is kind of, I made that to kind of go with uh, dying for the light. It's the, like a, a companion that? guide? It's a companion guide. It's kind of the meditation that I got afterwards because I okay. meditate a lot. That's how I healed myself. A part of it is through meditation. I would soak in a soaking tub and, and uh, water is real important to me still. And after I had my experience when I was in the hospital down the hall, was a Victorian bathtub and I soaked in that for those 10 days and that's how I healed myself a lot of it so I still like to soak in water my and um and do um um healing work there and so so meditation so that's one of the tools that I use and I thought I'd just pass it on so it's um it goes with the dying for the light if you want and that's kind of why I made it so so that's that one and then this one is seized by Sekhmet can you see that or yes no yes that's uh, is that Anubis on the cover no this is Sekhmet she's a lion-headed uh female oh, goddess okay. okay yes now I can see it it's, it okay. wasn't very clear before that's good yes perfect. okay yeah and so what happened with her is I um do you want the story or do we have time yes. for that or? Yeah. okay so um I, I, the which time was it? I went to Egypt? Um, the first time. The first time I went to Egypt, they didn't tell me that her temple and her statue has never been moved. Okay? It's still there. It's still intact from how many thousands of years no one really knows. Amazing that that's the case. Yeah. And so her, her ka is there. Her energy is in there. And so you get a special permission and you, um, uh, you're able to go in with your group. And each person was able to get five minutes with her. I was just minding my own business. I had no idea 
about her. I didn't, I had never thought about her at all. I'm allergic to cats. So I, she just was <laughs> off my radar, right? So I walk into her temple. It's very, very dark, extremely hot outside. It's cool in there. And she's about seven foot tall, very narrow. Um, I have an image of her here. Where it is? Um, oh, I don't see it right now. So she's right here. My grandson gave her to me. So I'm in her temple. She's very tall. She's very thin. She has a lotus and an onk um, staff, a lotus staff and an onk. She's very beautiful. Um, and I'm just standing there. And, and um, she comes out of her statue, like you, like me looking at you in 3D. She mm -hmm. walks out. And when she walks out, a ring of fire comes around us. And then um, she puts down a golden stairs, like steps. I, she motions to me to step on the step. Everything's telepathic. I step on the step. The base of the step fills with that same looking kind of warm water that if it's warm, but the dark water, like when I went for my near death experience is there. And she locks in on me with her big red eyes. And that's the seas part where she sees me. And I'm standing on her steps and she has sees me. And she tells me that I'm powerful and that I've earned it. And, you know, basically, why don't I act like it? You know, kind of because I was going through a really bad divorce and I was having a really hard time coming into my power. I'm a very loving, giving, good, you know, healer you know all of that so she what she was telling me is to come into my power and she her energy was so strong that it cracked my front tooth and my body was shaking my whole body and my teeth were chattering and so when she she kind of says to me did you get it you got it like and then I said uh-huh and that's all I said you know I could hardly say anything out at all and then when she was done with me then she just kind of made a nod, and then the the um, the water came up, the fire went back. I stepped off. She put up the steps, and she walked back into her statue. Mm -hmm. And they came and got me, uh, the leader, and carried me out, kind of walked me out, and I cried for three days. Mm -hmm. Cried and cried and cried. Cried for the world cried for man's inhumanity to man, cried for my sisters, cried for my brothers, cried, just just all just cried and cried and cried until it was all complete. And then I felt so light and so great. So, so I got an extreme healing from her. Mm -hmm. And what I found out is that afterwards, this is about, I don't know, three, five years later, I'm in meditation. And, um, she comes into me, she always comes to this side. She came in, or this side, maybe more is this side. And she comes in and she says, I'd like for you to write a book about your experience with me. So I said, okay, sure, no problem. And I go onto the computer and I write it. I'm gonna do this. I go into a, a website, a got her segment goddess website. I had never been in it. The administrator happens to be there, gives me permission. I write, would you like to I'm going to write a story about my um, uh, healing with Sekhmet. Would you like to tell about your story? And so then I step back, I go back into meditation. And I'm thinking, what did I just do? I don't know how to, I'm not going to write. I don't have time to write. I don't want to do this. That's crazy. Get out of town. So I go back and I go, I'll just delete it. No one will ever know the difference. So I go back in and my um, um, the website's blowing up with mm -hmm. people had stories and wow. so I have a whole bunch of different people's stories from um, just all across section of people who've had uh, extraordinary experiences with her so they're wow. all in here and I'm an artist so not an artist but a designer and so I have a lot of beautiful artwork of people with her but she has never left she's always been here and so you can tune into her and I have a lot of segment friends now so um as, so that as it happens <laughs> as it happens yes yeah, yeah. and so it's, she is just alive and strong and and in our um in our life right now if we want her to be to be a tool to be used to help you in in any way that she can she has a very interesting story 
Um, mm. You'll read it in the book or you can go on to YouTube and hear her story. She has an interesting story. Mm. Um, I was actually going to do some Egyptian stuff in the magazine, so I might start with her, like do a bit of bio, biography. Yes, yes, yes. You're free to use anything out of my book too. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll, quote, I'll definitely quote you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so coming up in August this year, um, you will be leading a spiritual retreat to Glastonbury, England, to perform a ceremony in Stonehenge, mm -hmm. which sounds amazing. And uh, would you tell us a little bit more about the ceremony you'll be performing mm -hmm. and uh, the expected outcomes from it for your tour attendees? I mean, why do people want to do this? Uh, I mean, I've done a spiritual roadshow myself um, mm -hmm. for my own reasons, but I, I just... It, it's interesting to me that people would sign up to do a tour with strangers. Like I took along two two good friends with me mm -hmm. on mine, and um, I, sp I suppose it's yeah. I just wondered why they wouldn't be doing it with their tribe. I suppose, but maybe not everyone has a tribe. Mm -hmm. uh, I think for me, it's I love the area. Number one, I'm passionate about it. I studied there for three years with Kathy Jones with the goddess. Uh, her goddess classes that she teaches and her books. And um, and I, I just had to be there and be a part of it and breathe it. I know I've had past lives there too uh, and with the tour. And I wanted to share that. So it's more of a, 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 not only a goddess within you to get in touch with that, but also about your lineage or heritage involving the Arthurian movement. And just yeah. there's just that whole lore and that romanticism. And, and um, it is romantic. Yes. It's so romantic and beautiful and powerful. And I've had lots of experiences there, um, not with ET, but with different beings there at the Chalice Well. There's the Red Well and then the White Well. I love the White Well. Just probably love it more than the red well. And I'd like to just share these and all of these experiences with the people that come. And um, I just got it like I did in meditation, you know, and, and we'll see if people come or not. And I have a lot of friends there and know people that, um, that can, they're good teachers and healers themselves. And then also we're going to do it in August so that I've been there many times because I love the crop circles. So we would incorporate the crop circles there as well, visitation into the crop circles. So we, it's a crop circles, it's goddesses. And then it's, uh, I happened to be in London staying in a hotel when it was the first time that Stonehenge was open to the public in oh, many, yeah. many, many years. I don't have to remember that time, but I happened to be there. So I rented a taxi now I think about this later. <laughs> and it's like an hour and 45 minutes away or something, you know, and went there and, wow. and, and got to be there with the stones. And now they have that fence around it and you have to have special permission, which we would have to have a ceremony there. And yeah. so it'll, it, it'll, it, I kind of, I don't know what I'm going to do yet. I know that sounds kind of weird, but I'll know when I get there what I'm supposed to do. Just don't um, slaughter anything on the slaughter stone. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. It would be like it, uh, it would depend on who comes and and what they need and and uh, how we can be of service and uh, nice. and also have a wonderful, amazing, fun time at the same time. Yes, I I know. In when I went back in two thousand and six, you weren't allowed to touch the stones anymore which I thought was, well, what's the point in going there if you're not to get the energy of the stones? And I, I had this big debate with the police officer, who one of the police officers that guards it, and I said, well, look, this is pointless coming here if you can't actually put your hands on a stone. I said, how are you supposed to you know, feel the energy of the space or walk around the space and in between? And he just said, oh, we, you know, and his excuse was, oh, people have been chipping away parts of the stones and taking them home and and I just said well if you're here that won't happen so why can't I just walk over and put my hands on a stone mm -hmm. and he, he didn't have any good reason why I couldn't do that which, well and yeah. and I find it where we're traveling that's more more the likelihood of that happening that there's fencing around all of the wonderful 
historic uh, relics that we have. And um, so it's, it's wrong. I agree with you. It's totally wrong that people respect it. We're mostly good loving people that I know there's those that whole part out there. But like you said, if you have the police, I totally agree with you.